Recording in progress. My name is Ava Babbler. Today is April 6, 2023. The time is 5.07 p.m. We are at the Pewaukee VFW. I am interviewing John Schultz, who was born on June 1, 1946 in Waukegan, Illinois, and served in the Vietnam War between 1966 to 1969 and 1978 to 2009. John Schultz was a Staff Sergeant E-6 in the United States Army and served as a communications specialist. This interview is sponsored by Bell Tower Memorial. So the first question we have is, what were you going to be before entering service? When I graduated from high school, I was attending Western Illinois University in Macomb, Illinois, and I was looking to be an eighth grade science teacher. And uh, I enjoy working with youth and but I became a retired service person in lieu of. Sure. And what was the hardest part of leaving for the Army? Oh, the hardest part about leaving for the Army was leaving the family and the close-knit group and the friends and uh, entering into an unknown world and yeah. the way the news was broadcasting Vietnam, knowing it was going to be part of it. It was scary. But uh, we got through it. Yeah, for sure. And tell me about your early weeks of basic training. When I uh, left on the train out of Waukegan, Illinois, to go downtown Chicago to the reception station, uh, we went in and we took our physicals and made sure that our, our documents and everything aligned up and we were doing the right. And then they lined about 30 of us up and they says, count off by four. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. All the ones stepped forward, turned to the right, welcome to the Navy. That's the look I had, yes. <laughs> so then they said all the twos stepped forward, turned to the left, welcome to the Marines. All the three stepped forward, welcome to the Air Force. Number four, Army, stay where you are. And that was scary because being born and raised in a town in North Chicago, Illinois, mm -hmm. right outside Great Lakes Naval Training Center, if I'd have gone in the Navy, I'd have been written out of a will. <laughs> but from there, we got on board the train and got down to Fort Polk, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And I'm very scared. We get off the train. We jump on a bus. We get to Fort Polk. We get off, and here's these guys doing nothing but yelling and screaming and hollering and go to the left, and then the one right next to no, go to the right, and it was confusing, very, very confusing, and they were doing it on purpose just to break us down. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden, I happened to look, and I see this gentleman. His name was Bialetto, and he had this blue band on with some stripes on, and I finally get a chance to say something to him. I said, excuse me there, Acting Corporal Bialetto, are you from North Chicago? He turned around and looked at me, and we graduated from high school together. He was there in the reception station, but he was a carryover. So they made him an acting jack for a couple of days. And we played football together. He was my quarterback. And then there we are. So it made things a little bit easier. He kind of made sure John had it not quite as bad as the rest of them. Wow. And then from there on, uh, going through the reception station, I was called upon and says, you know, John, uh, they're a young uh, private. You've got some college time. You're eligible to be an officer. I said, oh, really? What can, I, and I've been working for the telephone company, uh, Illinois Bell Telephone. So if I could go to Signal Corps and be a signal officer, yeah. He says, we can do that. So I filled out the forms, did everything, took my board, and it came back. There's my orders a couple days later. Light Infantry OCS, Fort Ord, California. The life expectancy of a young lieutenant in Vietnam in that branch was about 24 hours. So I says, i am got to get out of this. Mm -hmm. And I withdrew, and the next day, a couple of guys come over with these green hats, these green berets, mm -hmm. 
And they say, young man, you are eligible for special forces. I said, okay, what do I have to do? Well, you've got to be a three-year. You can't be a two-year, so you've got to enlist for another year. But he had this big old fan felled old computer dot matrix printout, and they had a listing of about a 1,000 names on there, and they were coming back from Germany in about a year, year and a half. The training that I would have gone through would have taken more than a year, year and a half, and I would have been going to Germany to replace them. So, okay, the year I sign up, I go to Germany, everything's going to work out good. Didn't work. Mm. Six months later, I completed all my special forces training and was on my way to Vietnam. I made it. I survived. So those were the early mm -hmm. days. Wow. And going into what was jump school like? Scary. Very, very, very scary. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because our special forces training was condensed. <clears throat> Excuse me. I went to my MOS school, my military occupational school as a communication specialist from 11 at night to 7 o'clock in the morning. And then when we got done with school, we went back to the barracks area at 7 o'clock in the morning for supper. And then we got done with supper. Then we did a lot of our hand-to-hand -hand and a lot of other kind of stuff. And then we uh, jumped on a big bus, and we went from uh, Fort Gordon, Georgia, where our training was, up to Fort Bragg, and then to Fort Benning. And they said, okay, this is how you put a parachute on. This is how you do this. This is how you do that. And within a week later, we were jump qualified. We had done our five jumps. Normally, it's a two- to three-week class. But standing at the door of a C-47 and looking down 1,000 feet and wondering if this parachute is really going to work, is it all, what's it going to be like down there? It was scary. It was very mm -hmm. scary. When I retired out of the Army in 2000, I had 830 parachute jumps. Wow. And the last was just as scary as the first. Mm-hmm. Wow. And how did you rig equipment for airdrops? Well, there's going through certain schools, there's a group of Army personnel called riggers. Mm -hmm. And they have to be jump qualified. And they're the ones that actually take all the equipment and put it on pallets, lash it down, put the big netting over the top, tighten it up attach the parachute or parachutes, depending on the, the weight. And they're the ones that actually do that, loading it into the aircraft, taking off, getting up the back, push it out the back door, chute opens, it drops to the ground. Occasionally, we had to do some of that stuff because they were even dropping Jeeps out of the back end of airplanes on parachutes and old three-quarter ton pickup trucks to get them in where they needed to do because it was quicker than um, you know, driving them. Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, thank God for my Boy Scout training because I, we had a lot of knots to tie and everything worked and we never lost anything. Wow. And how did you adapt to military life? It was not as difficult for me to adapt to military life as it was for a lot of the young guys around me. Mm -hmm. My grandfather was a World War I Marine. My father was a World War II pilot of a B-25, Billy Mitchell. Uh, I had an uncle who was in Korea. And I had another uncle who was actually over in Africa for a while. So I was kind of brought up in a, in a, a little bit with a military discipline. But because of organizations like the American Legion and the VFW who sponsored Boy Scout Troop and competitive drum and bugle corps, I was involved in Boy Scouting and I, all the way up until actually the week before I left to go off to basic training. So I had a lot of training of discipline and leadership through the Boy Scouts and I was very involved in that northern Illinois area in competitive drum and bugle corps. 
I was a drum major for the national champion Sons of the American Legion Corps, and that taught me a lot of other kind of discipline. So with that military association, basic training was not as difficult for me as it was for a lot of the other young guys around me. I knew how to take it. I knew what to do. Mm -hmm. And I got through it. Well, that makes sense. And what special skills did you learn as a Green Bear? Oh, my goodness. Um, I'm going to say one of the first biggest life-giving skills that I learned working as a Special Forces Green Beret was the ability to work as a team. Mm -hmm. And everybody had their own little niche, their own little job, and, and everybody worked together to get the missions done. But even though we worked individually, we had a goal that we worked for as a group, as mm -hmm. a team, and we listened, we did it, and we communicated. Mm -hmm. And I think we communicated even by way of just looking at each other, we didn't even have to go verbally. We could walk and we could talk and we could read each other and know to go left or know to go right. Yeah. And it taught a lot of life, life skills that I, I carried throughout the rest of my life. Wow. Mm -hmm. And moving on, what was it like living in Vietnam? Oh, living in Vietnam was complicated it was mm -hmm. wonderful it was earth shattering it was i want to get out of here i don't like this place mm -hmm. but my god i look at the people the vietnamese the people that we were working with mm -hmm. and there was a sense for us to be there that i felt we were fulfilling for humanity mm -hmm. one of the things that a lot of people don't realize where i was based at An K Vietnam, supporting and working with the 1st Air Cav Division, is that the Air Cav Association, a group of people who were with it and all that, mm -hmm. uh, and now to the military, they were actually sponsored, paid for, and kept an eight room school going downtown An K. Mm -hmm. Now, it was an eight room cinder block building that the CAB Association paid for. And had we not been there, those kids in that town would have not had that school. Mm -hmm. They was, and that school ran for more than eight years. So had we not been there with the first CAB and the association, those kids wouldn't have had the education. They wouldn't have had the books. The first CAB Association paid even the teachers the books, everything it took to get that school going. Mm -hmm. When I got to An K, we were living in, we call GP medium tents, 16 by 32 foot tents. We were living on cots. Mm -hmm. We had a little generator out the backside, the kind you use to go camping with nowadays. And that's what we had for electric. The roads were nothing but dirt that were sprayed with oil and a little bit of tar so that it wasn't quite so muddy. We didn't have any telephones in a lot of the company headquarters. It was, it was very backwoods-ish per se. Mm -hmm. Two years later when I left, we had blacktop roads. Mm -hmm. Two years later when I left Vietnam, we actually had buildings, single story barrack buildings that we were living in. We actually had dial telephones, which was the modern thing at the time, in the company headquarters, in the barracks, and, and all around. That base at An K had developed in that two-year time frame mm -hmm. <clears throat> that that infrastructure of the roads, the central power, and all that went over to enhance the community. And they had an infrastructure when we left. So getting there and eating sea rations, to two years later going to a mess hall and actually having real food, it was a big change. And I was glad that I was there to see it happen. Wow. And yeah, specifically, where did you sleep each night and did you sleep well? 
Oh, it would depend on where I was, what I was doing, what was going on. Mm -hmm. um, I did have in this barracks, I had what we called a hooch because I was an NCO. I had a corner of the building that was actually one of the largest hooches in that building. I had a spot that was 16 by 12 feet. No, I'm sorry, 10 by 12. 10 by 12 square foot, that was my hooch, and that's where my cot was that I slept on for the two years. And uh, I actually had a light bulb up there that I could turn power on and off, pull the cord and turn the light off at night. Mm -hmm. And and it was nice to get back to that place because there were other times when our team would jump in the back end of a pickup truck, army pickup truck, and get mm -hmm. out to an area and get in a helicopter and mm -hmm. take off and go someplace. And uh, helicopter pilot says, okay, we're approaching your drop zone. We're going to jump into this area. Mm -hmm. And well, how high are we? Well, I think we're about 300, 350 feet. Or at 350 feet, we're looking, this is dark night, and we could mm -hmm. look down and we could see hills. Well, are we 350 feet from the top of the hill or 350 feet from the bottom of the valley? And where are we going to be landing? Oh, you'll be okay. We're going to go fast. So the helicopter would go fast. We'd jump out, and our forward momentum would catch the parachute, and that would help us slow down as we would jump into that area. Once we got into that area, <clears throat> whatever branches and big leaves we could find to make a bed, this is what we slept on. We would take our poncho and tie the poncho liner to the inside and fold it in thirds, and that was our sleeping bag. Was it comfortable? No. Mm -hmm. Was it quiet? No, because the monkeys and everything else all around would make a noise at us all night long. Mm -hmm. So. It depended on how much we slept, to where we were, and what we were doing. Mm -hmm. Those are the peaceful nights. Yeah. And how much food did you get? And were you ever too hungry to do anything, or no? We would always get issued some what we called um, uh, uh, sea rations. Mm -hmm. uh, we also had some other things called... LERPs, Long Range Reconnaissance Patrol Subsistence. Mm -hmm. It was like instant food in a, in a big envelope. And if you wanted to open it up and you find you got spaghetti in there, but it was dry. So we didn't have to carry any liquid weight. Mm -hmm. And then you take and pour a little bit of water in there and let it rehydrate and you would have your spaghetti, your SpaghettiOs, mm -hmm. you know, rehydrated. There might be some rehydrated uh, pork chops, rehydrated beef. Uh, a lot of times we didn't rehydrate re it. We would pork jerky and beef jerky. And, mm -hmm. and were there times when we were hungry? Lots of times when we were hungry. Ever mm -hmm. too hungry not to do our job? Job came first. Mm -hmm. I'll get a chance yeah. to eat when we have the time. Yeah, for sure. And how bad was the weather? Did it affect you or not really? Coming from Illinois in mm -hmm. May, it was kind of springtime. And then going down to Fort Polk, Louisiana, uh, it was very warm, very hot. Going to Fort Gordon, Georgia, was hot and warm. And going to Vietnam in January was... Uh, hot and warm mm -hmm. so i but the humidity over there was a lot different than anything else it exposed to stateside yeah. so it took some while to get used to especially with a thing called the monsoons mm -hmm. we would look at our watch it's about 10 minutes to two in the spring in the monsoon season so break out your poncho get mm -hmm. covered up because at two o'clock the monsoons start and like clockwork, they would for about 20 minutes. Wow. And it would be a tremendous downpour. And it's something you learn to live with. 
old. Wow. And were you ever homesick? There were a few times when I would sit and I would wonder what was going on back at home, especially when I get letters from my mother. You know, I want to know how I was doing because she saw this on TV. Mm -hmm. And it was hard to get them to realize what they're seeing on TV isn't where I was mm -hmm. necessarily. Vietnam's as big as the state of Illinois. So they might have been seeing something that was filmed in the north and then the next day something in the south. It, it, it made me homesick that I wanted to get home to a point to let them know everything is okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And what was it like to train the South Vietnam soldiers? I enjoyed it because they wanted to learn. They wanted to take ownership. They wanted us sitting in the back seat so they could do it. Mm -hmm. And I owe my life to the Bung Lao that we worked with over there too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what was your favorite part about living in Vietnam? Exposure and experience to different cultures, working with Australians, working with Canadians, working with Koreans. Um, and we're all trying to do the same thing and the terminology they used was a little bit different, but mm -hmm. as teams with the same goal, we got through it. Mm -hmm. And what was your highest rank? I was a master sergeant when I retired at 28 and a half years. Wow. And what medals or honors did you receive as well? <clears throat> I had the opportunity to be awarded the Silver Star. I had the opportunity to be awarded the Bronze Star with V device. Mm -hmm. On my uniform, I wore a Purple Heart, four of them. It took me a while to learn how to duck. I've got Air Medal, I've got Legion of Merit, I've got Meritorious Service. On my uniform, I wear 18 different medals. Wow, that's crazy. And what were they for? Did you want to share the stories about your Purple Hearts? Uh, I would like to, but it's going to take too much time and I can hold that. Okay. And... What was it like to transition to civilian life and your job after the military? When I came back from Vietnam in, in, uh, in 69 and going to go back to my telephone, telephone mm -hmm. company, and I got out, I went back, and I, I think I got home like on Thursday. I enjoyed Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Monday I got in the car and I went down to the, the garage where I was going to work out of, and the boss says, no, John. You're not coming back to work yet. You got to go home and spend two weeks. You just came back from Vietnam. You need time. And it was hard to transition. It was very difficult. We didn't have that regimented and people looking at us and seeing the short hair and being called baby killers. And it, it was hard to transition at first. Yes. Yeah, for sure. And why did you re-enlist in the reserves? <clears throat> in living up in the Stevens Point area and running a bar in 1978, a guy walked in and he said, hey, uh, you know, you can join the Army Reserve for a year and try and see if you like it. All the senior people were leaving. They didn't have to hide in the reserve anymore, so they didn't have to get sent to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So the reserve and National Guard were losing all their NCOs and officers, and he said, try it, see if you like it for a one-year enlistment. So I figured, well, getting if I join the reserve, the money I'll be making will pay my mortgage payment so it doesn't have to come out of my tavern business. Mm -hmm. I don't have to worry about life insurance. It'll come out of my reserve, SGLI, which was going to save me money. And there were a few other benefits because my tavern it was only a couple of miles away from the reserve center. So I said, well, if I go over there and I tell the guys, I'll put up the first five pitchers of beer tonight after drill, I'll get 80 of them in the front door. So it was advertising. Mm -hmm. And then and after that year, I had an opportunity to then, I liked it. 
I took a three-year enlistment. And during the first year of that three-year, I got a call to go back on active duty as an advisor to the reserve. And that's how I went back on active duty. Wow. And share an example of strong leadership that you showed in the military. Oh, wow. When, when I was with this reserve unit back then, because it was a signal unit based on it was a telephone type company, I was able to use what I had learned in the army through communication to enhance them. And it paid off later, later on, uh, working for United States Army Reserve Command out of the Pentagon <clears throat> my last four years and being a special investigator, the skills that I had learned earlier paid off a lot too. And I was an instructor at the NCO Academy at Fort McCoy for about three years also. Mm -hmm. And I got selected that because they said I had a voice that could carry and I had a demeanor that people better listen to. Mm -hmm. You got that? Why are you looking yeah, at me and smiling? I got no clown face on. <laughs> and because of that, I learned and I enjoyed it and I had fun. Mm -hmm. Wow. And what do you consider to be your most important contribution during your service? By being able to pass on skills to younger soldiers, knowing that if they're called upon to do something, what I taught them is going to be payoff in life-saving skills. Wow. That makes sense. And have you remained in contact or reunited with fellow veterans? Oh, yes. I, yes, I have. Um, I owe my life to the VFW for sponsoring the Boy Scouts and that drum corps. Mm -hmm. And I've been very active in the VFW here in the state of Wisconsin. And mm -hmm. I work with veterans on a weekly basis, yes. Wow. Well. Yeah, and that kind of goes into our next question. Are you a member of any veterans organizations? The VFW, the American Legion, the Sons of the American Legion, the, the Purple Heart Association, 82nd Airborne Division Association. Yeah, there's about, wow. about seven or eight of them that I'm involved with, yes. That's great. And what are some life lessons that you learned from military service? To be gentle when it's time to be gentle. Mm -hmm. to be cognizant of people's feelings, but yet try to keep in mind when it's time to stand up and be a leader, take charge, be the leader. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And is there anything else that you wanted to share? No, I want to thank you, and I want to thank everybody for what they're doing. We need us, the veterans of all conflicts, of all stages, need to pass on this verbal history. Mm -hmm because yeah. it's being lost and I cannot thank you all enough for allowing me to have this opportunity because there are so many things like talking about the school that the first CAV mm -hmm. had, the power, the, the infrastructure mm -hmm. of, of, the, of Vietnam, the highways, the roads. A lot of people think Vietnam soldiers were all walking through rice paddies. They think yeah. we were all being shot up, blown up, and no, that, mm -hmm. that's not how it was. Working with the mountain yards and, and working with the Hmong, the Lao, the, it, just the exposure, working with all of them was so tremendous and eye-opening. Mm -hmm. And now coming back and people stateside nowadays don't realize all of that. And we need yeah. to pass it on. I we agree. do. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Not really at this time. I thank you. Perfect. So in closing, all right. Let me ask you this. Why do you want to do this? Well, I, of course, have connections to the military as my grandfather was in the Korean War. 
So it means a lot to me to bring you guys or share your stories and really have that given to the world. So I love that I'm able to do this. And, and I'll tell you, and we're glad that you're doing it too. Mm -hmm. We've got to get this history, this verbal history. Yes. We've got to preserve it. We've got to maintain it. We've got to pass it on. It's being lost. I certainly agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think every veteran has such an amazing story. It's really awesome to see that. And mine are true. <laughs> All right, so now in closing, this has been an interview of John Schultz regarding his service during the Vietnam War. My name is Ava Babbler, and the time is 5.36 p.m. And thank you for this interview, and most importantly, thank you for your service. Oh, thank you. It's been an honor. It's a privilege. <laughs>